Guns for General Washington. Chapter 18. A Walk in the Rain. It was drizzling in Boston. A thin rain, more like cold mist. The two companions walked down Beacon Street, their jacket collars turned up, their shoulders haunched against the wetness. Nearby on the common, a company of soggy redcoats was going half-heartedly through a drill. The walkers stopped to watch. They're a sorry-looking lot, Paul Jr. whispered. Old Toby grunted, part of Howe's reinforcements. Three troop ships came in yesterday from England with a whole passel of new soldiers. Paul frowned. I was afeard of it. I saw the ships anchored off Hudson Point this morning. The old boatman spat in the muddy road. Tuh! There be rumors, he said in a low voice, that England's having trouble getting volunteers. Not many British lads are keen on sailing the ocean to fight us on our home ground. I hear tell Bow Wow House had to scrape the bottom of the barrel. Paul studied the Marines drilling carelessly. Looks to me like they're half starved. Toby nodded. Aye, it's the thin rations. But I'll tell you something, lad. Their cannon aren't going hungry. There's plenty of powder to feed them. And now it looks like the British have most as many fighting men as General Washington. The strollers, one young and vigorous, the other old and hobbling, went past John Hancock's mansion on the slope of Beacon Hill. Hancock, a rebel leader, wanted by the British, was safe in Philadelphia. But one of Howe's aides, General Henry Clinton, was using the Hancock home as a headquarters. So it had been spared destruction. The drizzle finally ended and the walkers turned into Cornhill Street, where Henry Knox once had a bookshop. Near the old state house, they leaned against a mossy wall and the boatman lit his pipe. He looked up and down carefully, then leaned over to his young friend. Look you, Master Paul, Washington's had another dispatch from Colonel Knox. Your friend Will and his cannon have got as far as Claverack. I'd say they're nigh on halfway. Now they must come east over the mountains. Paul was excited at the news. I keep hoping and praying they'll reach Cambridge soon, he sighed. Do you think they'll make it? The old timer squinted up at the clouded sky. Can't rightly say, but if they don't, Boston's done for. The city was gloomy and half deserted. A few people in drab clothing hurried by, their faces thin and pale. Paul tried to shift to a cheerier note. Toby, I had a mind to ask you, what does the new flag look like? The boatman's old face crinkled into a smile. The Grand Union flag? She's mortal fine, lad. I was right there when General Washington raised her for the first time. She's got red and white stripes, 13 of them, one for each colony. And in the upper corner, the canton, they calls it. There's a small Union Jack for old time's sake. The veteran shook his head with wonder. I tell you, son, it's powerful good to see our own flag flying in the breeze over Cambridge. Paul looked around at the sad gray city. You think, he asked wistfully, we'll ever see it flying here over Boston? Toby trudged along, chewing moodily on his pipe, and gave no answer. And we'll read chapter 19 next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you. Bye-bye.